Hello, and welcome to Magic and Pathfinder Part 6, Casting and Spell Attacks. Casting spells works much the same way as other activities in the game. You must have the spell prepared in advance, or have a valid spell slot available in the case of spontaneous casters, and then you spend the number of actions listed in the spell's description. As mentioned in a previous video, most spells intended for encounter mode require two actions, except for those that cause something to physically manifest and persist in the world, and those usually take three actions. But those are just guidelines, so always make sure you check the spell's description to know exactly how many actions are needed. Once the action cost has been met, the spell effect immediately occurs. Some spells are not intended for use in encounter mode, and instead have their casting times listed in terms of minutes or hours. You cannot use any other actions or reactions while casting these spells, but the GM might allow you to speak while casting them. And although not displayed in the spell's description, all spells that have casting times listed as minutes or hours automatically receive the exploration trait. And since they have the exploration trait, they cannot be cast at all in encounter mode. So if the casting time is one minute, you can't spend 10 encounter rounds to cast it, even though 10 combat rounds equals one minute. And if combat does break out in the middle of casting an exploration spell, then that spell is immediately disrupted. Some abilities and circumstances can cause a spell to be disrupted and lost. A common example is being struck by an attack of opportunity while casting. In a previous video, we discussed spell components and the traits that are added when casting with those components. If you cast a spell that has a material, somatic, or focus component while within reach of an enemy capable of attacks of opportunity, that enemy can use their reaction to strike you. And if that attack is a critical hit, then the spell you are casting is disrupted. When a spell is disrupted, it is lost along with all resources that were committed to the casting of that spell, meaning you lose all of the required actions if it was a spell that cost three actions and it is immediately dispelled by an enemy's attack of opportunity, then you still lose all three actions. The attack of opportunity does not occur after the first of those three actions, leaving you two that you can still spend on other activities. It's all or nothing. And all other resources are also lost, so you lose the spell slot that was committed as well as any material cost for the spell. And when an attempt to sustain a spell is disrupted, not only is that action lost, but the spell that you are attempting to sustain immediately ends. Another important consideration on casting spells is line of effect. This really applies to all ranged attacks, but can be especially noteworthy when it comes to spells. Line of effect means there is an unobstructed path to the target, and generally, as long as the target is not behind a solid wall, that blocks all physical access to them, then you have line of effect. When you cast any spell, not just spell attacks, you must have line of effect to the target. This is wholly separate from line of sight. By raw, if you can see a target, but there is not an unobstructed physical path to them, then you cannot target them with a spell. If the target is only partially behind a solid object, like behind a gate or portcullis, then there is line of effect and you can target them, but they have cover. And the rule of thumb provided by the core rulebook is that a one foot square gap in a barrier is all that's needed to allow line of effect, but as always, the GM has the final say. And also be aware that if casting a spell with an area effect, then there needs to be line of effect both between the caster and where they are placing the origin of the effect, and line of effect between that point and all affected creatures and objects. For example, if you cast a fireball spell, you as the caster need to have line of effect to the point of detonation for the fireball. And in order for any enemy to be hit by that spell, those enemies also need to have line of effect to that point of detonation. Some spells require you to succeed at an attack roll to affect the target. Just like with weapon attacks, 
Spell attack rolls are opposed by the target's armor class. Spell attacks are a type of attack and therefore they're modified by any bonuses or penalties that affect attack rolls. For example, victims of a Bane spell suffer a negative one penalty to all attack rolls. This does include spell attack rolls too. Whatever effects say that they modify just attacks without specifying a specific type of attack, affect spell attacks too. But if the effect calls out a specific type of attack, like weapon attacks, then obviously those would not apply to spell attacks. Now one specific penalty that definitely needs to be discussed is the multiple attack penalty. This applies to all actions with the attack trait. For example, Acid Arrow requires a spell attack roll and has the attack trait. Therefore, it is affected by and contributes to the multiple attack penalty. But on the other hand, let's look at Tanglefoot. It also requires a spell attack roll, but it does not have the attack trait. And the multiple attack penalty only applies to activities with the attack trait. So, although Tanglefoot requires a spell attack roll, it is not affected by or contribute to the multiple attack penalty because it does not have the attack trait. In most cases, if a spell calls for a spell attack roll, it will have the attack trait and interact with multiple attack penalties, but just be aware that there are some rare cases like Tanglefoot that do not. When making a spell attack roll, your modifier is equal to your spellcasting ability modifier plus your spellcasting proficiency bonus. The ability modifier that is used depends on how you gain access to the spell you're casting. If your class granted the ability to cast the spell, then you use that class's spellcasting ability modifier, which is often, but not always, the same as the class's key ability modifier. Bards, champions, oracles, and sorcerers use charisma. Clerics and druids use wisdom, and witches and wizards use intelligence. Innate spells, which we'll be talking about more in an upcoming video, use the caster's charisma modifier, and other sources of spells can specify what ability modifier to use for their spells, but the rule of thumb is, when in doubt, use charisma. And this can lead to situations where a caster uses different ability modifiers to cast different spells. For example, a cleric would use their Wisdom modifier when casting Divine spells granted by their class, but that same cleric would use Charisma when casting Innate spells. And if that cleric also multiclassed into Wizard, then they would use their Intelligence modifier when casting Arcane Wizard spells. Spellcasting classes also grant proficiency in casting spells from a certain tradition, for example, starting druids have trained proficiency in primal spellcasting. And this bonus works the same as any other proficiency bonus. Trained proficiency grants 2 plus your level. Expert grants 4 plus your level. Master grants 6 plus your level. And legendary proficiency grants 8 plus your level. This can also mean that you might have different proficiency bonuses when casting different spells. A bard might be an expert in occult spellcasting, but have only trained proficiency when casting spells they gain from multiclassing into sorcerer. And it's worth noting that everyone who can cast innate spells has at least trained proficiency in those spells. But if they also have expert or higher spellcasting proficiency provided by their class, then their innate spells are also cast at that higher proficiency level. Each spell will detail what happens on a hit or miss. For example, Acid Arrow deals 3d8 acid damage plus 1d6 persistent acid damage on a hit. On a critical hit, you double the initial 3d8 damage, but not the persistent damage, and nothing happens on a failure or a critical failure. Some spells will call for the target to make a saving throw, such as a reflex save, to avoid a fireball blast or a will save to fight against mental manipulation. The DC for these saves is the same as the caster's spell DC, which is easy to calculate. It's just your base spell attack bonus plus 10. As a result, 
If a character can cast spells from multiple different sources, they may have different spell DCs, just like their spell attacks use different ability scores and have different bonuses. Each spell's description will either provide details as to what happens on a successful or failed save, or it will refer to it as a basic saving throw. These are very common for damaging effects, and what basic saving throw means is if you succeed, you only suffer half the listed damage. If you critically succeed, you take no damage. If you fail, you take the normal listed damage, and if you critically fail, you suffer double damage. With all of that in mind, let's look at a couple of common examples. Fireball calls for a basic reflex saving throw. When cast, all targets in the burst area must make a reflex saving throw versus the caster's spell DC. On a success, they suffer half of the fireball's damage. On a failure, they suffer the fireball's full damage. On a critical success, they suffer no damage at all. And on a critical failure, they suffer double the normal damage. That's how basic saves usually work, but as always, there are a few exceptions. Flaming Sphere, for example, calls for a basic reflex saving throw too, just like Fireball. But it has an additional line in its description that says targets do not suffer any damage on a successful save as opposed to half damage. So bottom line, make sure you always read the spell descriptions to know exactly how to resolve the saving throw of a spell. Before we close, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our patrons. These videos would not be possible without their continued generosity and support. Members of the Basics for Gamers Patreon community receive special benefits, like getting to vote on the topics that we cover in the future, and also they get to see these videos one week and ad-free before everybody else. Visit the link shown on the left of the screen and in the description if you'd like to know more about becoming a patron. If you would like to support this channel and help it grow, the easiest way to do that is by subscribing and clicking the bell icon so you get notified when new videos release. And we can always be reached through our Twitter and Facebook pages too. Thanks for watching, take care, and we will see you soon with more Basics of Pathfinder.